Come on in, everyone. Anybody have any questions while we're waiting for others to get in? Looks like everybody's, well, a lot of you are here, not quite everybody, but it's definitely time to get started. Anyone? All right, can everybody hear me? Feel free to chat if your speaker's not working or whatever. I went and got my Heisenberg haircut. So. <laughs> All right. Well, I guess we'll go ahead and get started. It doesn't seem like anybody has any questions. Uh, and I don't see any students from my day class. Uh, I had to cancel my day class today. I was uh, sick, uh, which is teaching is the only job in the world where if you take the day off because of sickness or illness it's way more work than if you just went to work and that was the case here so uh last time we more or less completed all of chapter 11 uh i didn't allude i mean i sort of just alluded to some of the stuff about uh linear or excuse me rotational uh angular momentum that is and basically what i told everybody was angular momentum we use the symbol l instead of p uh, and it turns out to be the R vector, which is a vector from any three point in space that you might determine to be the pivot point, but it really doesn't have to literally be a pivot point. You can go from anywhere in space you want to, to the point of, uh, of an object that's rigid, perhaps per, uh, if it's a, if it's a point size object, then it's right to its center of mass. If it's a, if it's a, a body, uh, that has some size then you go to its center of mass, but then you have another angular momentum uh, that relates to it about its center of mass. But if you take that R and you cross it with the momentum of that point particle, which is M times V, then you'll get the angular momentum. So that's one version of the angular momentum is L is equal to R cross P. Uh, another version is just like momentum is equal to mass times velocity, the rotational analog of momentum P, uh, momentum P was mass times velocity and the rotational analog of mass is moment of inertia and the rotational analog of velocity is angular velocity. So it should be moment of inertia times angular velocity. And that turns out to be correct. So L in magnitude is I times omega. Uh, so I, I just went over all that and I think the problems are pretty straightforward. You should be able to understand that. I think one thing that might not strike you as uh, obvious, uh, I, I sort of assume it is, but it, sometimes it's just not for people. If you have a planet orbiting its, uh, let's say one of our planets orbiting our sun, then we have these locations called aphelion and perihelion. And the perihelion is when it's closest to the sun, and the aphelion is when it's farthest from the sun. Uh, if it's something orbiting something else, like an object orbiting, let's say, uh, the Earth, then you have an apogee for geo, and a para G for geo again, uh, but basically that's it. The peri means nearby and the app means far away. So uh, the main thing about that is at those particular points, para G and apogee or perihelion and apogee, the velocity is actually exactly perpendicular to the R vector. So the momentum itself is also absolutely perpendicular to the R vector. So all you have to do is multiply the distance, which is called the perihelion distance times the perihelion velocity and uh, times the, the mass. And that will actually give you the angular momentum of a planet at perihelion, okay? Similarly, at apogee or aphelion, either one you're doing, you just multiply the distance of aphelion times the momentum of the planet at aphelion, which is the mass of the planet times the velocity at aphelion. That being said, conservation of momentum says you can know 
three of those things and the fourth one is automatically discovered. So if you know the velocity at perigee or perihelion, you can figure out the velocity at aphelion as long as you know the perihelion distance and the per, uh, apogee distance or aphelion distance. Okay. So that's the only thing that might not be obvious to you guys is that the velocities are actually perpendicular that way. So the angular momentum is literally just R times P instead of R cross P. So now we've got a lot more people in. Does anyone have any questions about anything? Like I said, we did finish chapter 11, so I'm going into relativity now. Was it chapter 11 or 10 that we finished? Was that, Michaela? Was it chapter 11 or 10 that we had finished? Uh, chapter 11 is what we finished. Yeah, chapter 10, we, we started uh, like on, I think, Monday of last week for you guys. And uh, that was more or less done or finished on Monday of last week. And then Wednesday, we started in chapter 11. And that was when we introduced uh, moment of inertia. And we integrated to find the moment of inertia. And then uh, this week, we did basically using those moments of inertia to calculate dynamical problems like uh, a cylinder rolling down an incline are a Atwood machine, which we did two complex Atwood machines where the, where the pulleys actually had weights and that sort of thing. We also did one with conservation of energy. So we sort of covered all the major topics of 11. I think those chapters are easy, uh, 11 uh, more so than, than 10. So that's why I didn't go too terribly much in detail, but there's plenty of stuff on my YouTube channel. And there's also, you know, you still have me. So make sure you guys ask me if you have any questions. I know I, I, know I did not do a lot of examples on those, so it's certainly cool to uh, ask me more. All right, ask me for more. Anything else? All right, so we're starting now. We're jumping to, I think your textbook is chapter 36. Problem is I'm using a couple different textbooks, so uh, it turns out there's a lot of different chapters for relativity, and uh, even with Giancoli, I use Giancoli for my 202 class and for my 241 class, but Giancoli for my 202 class is the applications, and uh, I forget the other word that they use for the title, but it's the algebra-based physics, and then this one's the calculus-based, so uh, I'm pretty sure 36 is the chapter on special relativity. Uh, I did my undergraduate work in general relativity, and then I did a master's in chaos theory, and then I went back and worked on general relativity again for my PhD work, but I'm ABD, I'm perpetually all but dissertation. Uh, I say I'm somewhat orphaned by my PhD advisor, but in reality, I was looking to get out because the job market wasn't looking very good. Uh, he had went on hiatus for a year, so I didn't get to interact with him. I got to interact with a PhD student, uh, I mean, with his, uh, his postdoc. And then it looked like he was going to actually leave, period. So I just went ahead and found a job. Uh, sadly, I haven't finished my PhD, but I've completed everything but the dissertation. So anyways, with regards to that, that's why I talk a little bit more about relativity uh, than some of your other instructors might. And we do cover it specifically because in a, a typical four-year institute, you're going to take uh, the sequence calculus-based physics is going to have a three-semester sequence. It'll be one, two, and three, and the three is all modern physics, where you start off with relativity, then you spit, which is one chapter, and then you do several chapters on quantum mechanics, usually two or three at least, uh, and then you go into nuclear physics, elementary particle physics, and uh, cosmology. So that's a, you know, that's a lot of stuff to cover. What we try to do is we always do relativity in the 241 class, and then we do the quantum mechanics in the 242 class. But if we have more time, we'll go back and do elementary particles in 241, and we'll do nuclear physics in 242 as well. I'm not sure where we're, where we're going to get to this time, but uh, I also cover a little bit of general relativity just because that's my interest, and that's why I was telling you that whole thing about what I did my work in. Uh, so... Basically, what happened was if you went around and, and uh, questioned scientists of the late 1800s, like really late 1800s, like the 90, 90s and 95 and later on up through the early 1900s, you probably would have got an overwhelming number, like 99.9% .9 of the scientists was saying that we've basically figured out all the laws of nature. Well, you know, we have Newton's laws of motion, uh, Newton's uh, optics as well as Huygens optics and stuff like that. 
uh, which were weird because they both were given the same results, but Huygens was sort of treating light as if it's uh, waves and Newton was treating as if it was particles, but they both got the same results, so it didn't really matter too terribly much. Uh, we had uh, a lot of equations like from Bernoulli and Pascal and stuff like that regarding fluid dynamics. Uh, we knew statistically how we could treat, you know, big numbers of things. So we had what we called statistical thermodynamics and statistical mechanics, which could explain even, you know, how atoms are behaving and stuff like that. So it was probably, if you ask all these scientists, they'd probably say, yeah, we're probably just going to go ahead and, and, you know, do a bunch of experiments to make sure that, you know, all these laws that we've been using over this time of Newton and, and all these people, Gauss and Maxwell and all that. Uh, they all are right to say eight decimal places instead of six, right? And and they had good reason to believe that because they really thought they understood stuff. Well, there's a couple of experiments going around that people hadn't quite figured out, but they just, you know, figured that was no big deal. So uh, one of them was, uh, was basically called the ultraviolet catastrophe, which basically we had two or three different laws that told us how uh, light would be emitted from an object as you heated it up, specifically like you can take a, you know, a piece of iron uh, shaft and throw it in a fire and you'll see it become ruddy red and it starts to glow red and it'll blow on through the Roy G. Biv thing. Well, that light that's put out by that can be cut up into, you know, like with a prism, for instance, cut up into individual frequencies and wavelengths frequencies are wavelengths and you should get a curve for the amount of energy that's put out of each wavelength and that wasn't matching any of the three rules and not only that any of the three rules slash laws that had been come up with uh didn't didn't overlap in all the same places so it was really jacked up that was solved by Planck uh there was a something called a photoelectric effect which basically said when you shine my uh, light on a pure metal it actually works in other metals too but with pure metals it's easier to see but if you shine light on a pure metal there's a certain amount of current that comes out and that made sense in some sense with the, with the idea of light being a wave, but it had some anomalies that light being a wave uh, predicted that it, we didn't see in the experimental process. So that was a little problem with that. Einstein fixed that in 1905 uh, with his paper on photoelectric effect, and that's the one he ultimately won the Nobel Prize for. And then there was this uh, other problem that we didn't necessarily know about, and that was these gas tubes uh, people could like suck out all the air of a glass tube and then backfill it with, say, hydrogen gas or helium gas or uh, water vapor or whatever, and then put a buttload of electricity across it. In other words, a lot of voltage across it and it would glow. And then you could send that light through a little slit to get a nice image. And then you could send that through a prism uh, that would, again, make it spread out over all those different wavelengths. And it was really neat because they thought this might be something really great for chemistry because you could use that. Was it turned out that hydrogen's little lines that came off of that looked very different from, say, helium's, and then helium's looked very different from, say, oxygen, and oxygen looked very different from, you know, mercury vapor, and it looked different than nitrogen and all that stuff. So they were thinking this might be something we could actually use to identify elements and compounds, and it is. It is a very powerful tool. Uh, we use it for quantum mechanics and stuff like that. But that and the Planck and the photoelectric effect thing that were all fixed by, like I said, uh, Planck and then Einstein, and uh, also this one, uh, the, the gas tubes, those were all called, solved by uh, quantum mechanics. But there was another issue that no one else saw was a problem. That's, uh, you know, some people will say the measure of a genius is their ability to hit a target that no one else could hit. I think a better definition of a genius, uh, as I got from a book on the Great American University, is that uh, genius is being able to see a target that no one saw and then hitting it. And that's what Einstein did. So no one knew anything was really going on wrong, uh, except really Einstein. And he he basically knew that if you take Maxwell's equations, which we'll study in, in the 242 class, and you put them together, you can make a wave equation. But it's weird because that wave equation seems to be telling us something that's quite odd. So like if you switch to a reference frame, uh, in which your coordinate system is moving, say, at half the speed of light compared to some other coordinate system, the wave equation doesn't change at all. And that was weird. And Einstein, when he analyzed what would happen for such scenarios, he kept getting these uh, paradoxes, you know, like he couldn't see his, uh, he couldn't see his own image in a, in a mirror while riding uh, a train car at half the speed of light and stuff like that. So a bunch of weird stuff kept coming out of it, and he just couldn't stand by that. So he ended up in 1905 writing a 
uh, paper roughly titled on the electrodynamics of, of uh, moving matter or something, something like that. But it really was about the electrodynamics. And that's the neat part. That was special relativity. What really Einstein realized was that uh, Maxwell's equations were telling us that we were, were lacking an understanding of physics. Specifically, we did not understand special relativity, and Einstein used Maxwell's equations to get that idea. So his idea come down to two principles. One, that the laws of physics are the same for all inertial observers. Now, you, you guys remember inertia, you know, Galileo's law of inertia, which later became uh, Newton's first law of motion, which basically says an object in motion tends to stay in that state of motion unless acted upon by a net external force. That's the same thing as Galileo's law of inertia, except Galileo took time to sort of make people feel better about turning their back on Aristotle by saying, you know, it's as if these particles, these things, this matter that we deal with has this quantity called inertia that makes an object not want to change its velocity. So why did Einstein mention that in there? Well, it turns out Einstein was really thinking on a much bigger plane. He was thinking in the end that he needed to deal with something that uh, Newton had discovered uh, but didn't address either because he knew he couldn't. So Newton, when he came up with his law of gravity, realized that it was really strange, but he also realized that he could solve a lot of problems with it, even with the strangeness. And he couldn't see any way that he would solve the problem with it, uh, but he knew he could get stuff done. So he just said, I'm not going not gonna to address that right now. I'm just going to keep working with it because I can do a lot of things. I can explain why the tides go in and the tides go out. I can explain why planets are spheres. I can explain uh, why they sweep out uh, equal areas in equal times, uh, why they make elliptical orbits, and why the square of the period of an individual planet is proportional to the cube of its semi-major axis. And that's true for all objects orbiting one another, uh, orbiting one another, and stuff like that. So all that stuff he could do just with general, uh, just with his idea of gravity as it was. But the problem was, it was as if our sun, for instance, is reaching out over space and holding on to the Earth, for instance, and pulling on it, but we don't see anything reaching out there. It's called action at a distance. It was like a force was applied without touching something. So that bothered Newton. It bothered Einstein as well. And Einstein just could not, for that reason, see uh, gravity as a force because it doesn't make any sense that something you can just re reach across space and pull something else without touching it. So that's what he was actually doing. Because if you imagine this, imagine you sit on one of those merry-go-rounds that you see at a, a public park or something, the little round things. Uh, Tosh Point has done some fun stuff with them where people will actually put motorcycles against them and turn the wheel up and it'll start spinning real fast and people start flying off like, you know, <laughs> like one of those video games, uh, SimCity video games, where you make a uh, amusement park, and if you don't keep your stuff ma uh, managed and maintained, people start flying off the uh, roller coasters and junk like that. Well, this actually happens in real life because people uh, try to sit in those merry-go-rounds or teacups or something like that while someone spins it so fast with a motorcycle wheel that they could, you know, literally die. But Tosh has a lot of videos like that. But if you just imagine that that scenario, that rotating uh, disc, okay. Now, imagine mounting a camera to it where you can only see the disc itself. You can't see the ground around the disc. All you see is the disc. And imagine putting, a, a let's say, a, a basketball in the center of the frame of view of that camera. Now, from that camera standpoint, okay, uh, someone might actually take and spin that disc, but that camera is spinning with it. So the disc isn't moving with respect to the camera at all. And all it sees is this ball sitting here, and all of a sudden, with nothing acting on it, it just shoots out the side. Uh, that, to the frame of the camera, is a non-inertial reference frame because there did not appear to be a force acting on it, yet it accelerated. It did not obey Newton's first law of motion or Galileo's law of inertia. That's exactly the way Einstein was seeing gravity. So he put in the laws of physics are the same for all inertial observers to cut out gravity. He's specifically saying, hey, uh, gravity doesn't act like uh, there's, a, or gravity is not a force. And therefore I'm picturing the universe as if it's a non-inertial reference frame because we see these uh, planets traveling in elliptical, circular, hyperbolic, uh, parabolic orbits with no forces acting on them. OK, so if he if he eliminated that, then he could stop worrying about gravity and just talk about physics without gravity. So that was his first principle. The laws of physics are the same for all inertial observers. 
and that's sort of a uh, sort of a reapplication of what we call the uh, Copernican revolution. The Copernican revolution and the scientific revolution being two different things, but the Copernican revolution being specifically uh, that part of it where we say we're not really perfect or special. And I don't mean that in a derogatory way. I just mean that uh, whatever laws of physics we find here on earth should be the same everywhere. It's not like we're the special area where it's gonna have certain laws, but if we look at some other planet uh, around some other star, they're gonna have entirely different laws. So that that's part of the Copernican revolution is that we're not special, so we don't expect our laws to be special. We expect our laws to be fundamental everywhere we go. So that's sort of a continuous of that because you're just saying, hey, it doesn't matter what your reference frame is, the laws of physics are the same, okay? Now, the other part was the weird part, but this was already correct by uh, Maxwell's equations. So remember Maxwell's equations, electricity and magnetism are already relativistically correct. And what it is, is the speed of light is a constant, independent of the motion of the source and independent of the motion of the observer. So this is as if we're standing on the back of a flatbed Mack truck that's driving at 60 miles per hour on a long, straight, level road. And uh, let's say we're you know a big league pitcher that can pitch 100 miles per hour and we throw in the same direction the truck is going. Now you can go back to what we discussed in like chapters one, two, and three about relative motion. And you'd see that if, if I throw in the same direction as a truck that's moving at 60 miles per hour and I throw at 100 miles per hour, then someone way out in front of the truck and the ball are gonna see the ball coming at them, not at 60 and not at 100, but at 160 miles per hour. And that's just the way the laws of physics work. If I threw backwards, for instance, they'd say it was moving at negative 40. In other words, they say moving away from them at 40 because I threw faster than the truck. And therefore, uh, the truck is getting closer to them, but the ball is getting farther away from them. So that's just the way things work. But what Einstein's saying is uh, the, con the speed of the light is a constant independent of the motion of the source and independent of the motion of the observer is that if I was throwing light balls instead of uh, baseballs, in other words, that's throwing photons, uh, you wouldn't measure that to be except the speed of light. So if if I'm on the back of a Mac, bed, uh, a Mac truck, flatbed Mac truck, uh, moving at, let's say, seven eighths the speed of light, and I shoot a photon torpedo in the same direction as the Mac truck's going, okay, then you're going to see the Mac truck coming at you at seven eighths the speed of light, but Oddly enough, you're going to see that the light that I shot at you is coming at the speed of light. The light from the headlights of the truck are going to come at you at the speed of light. And guess what? I'm going to measure that the speed of light, that the light, the photons that are leaving my gun as I'm riding on the back of that Mack truck are also leaving at the speed of light. So it's really an absurd thing. And as you might guess, the law that tells us how to add uh relative motion, in other words, how to add velocities from two different reference frames. Remember, we said it was VAC, that's V sub AC is equal to VAB plus VBC, where the inner uh, prefixes uh, had our inner uh, subscripts had to match each other and the outer ones had to match the ones on the other side of the equation. That's not working anymore. Not, not when we're dealing with the speed of light and other enough, but not when we're dealing with anything close to the speed of light. So if you get on the order of a couple percent or 10 percent of the speed of light uh other things start showing that same weird behavior so any questions on that now i'll just tell you just for a little bit of the history so einstein writes that and he wins the nobel prize for the photoelectric effect he did not win it for relativity uh but he also wrote that time on the brownian motion that proved that was the very first quantitative proof that we had that atoms exist so he could have won a nobel prize for that uh, he wrote back as an appendix uh, the day after he sent his, his publication for the uh, electrodynamics of moving bodies. He sent an appendix. Oh, by the way, I discovered this little thing, E equals MC squared. That actually turns out to solve the problem of how was how is the sun alive? Because space, uh, I say alive, you know what I mean? It's not, not literally alive. But uh, basically, uh, we had a historical record 
uh, namely things like the Epic of Gilgamesh from its time period was like the oldest thing there was and the comparable time period was the Old Testament and we had the Old Testament telling us specifically, uh, you know, when the earth was created and that looked around if you do the math it looked around like 10,000 years if you go back and add up the begats and what age the people were when they begat such and such and then add up all those ages until we recognize someone we know in history which is Nebuchadnezzar uh you'd find that basically the universe is on you know on the order of 10,000 years old well that's nice because Lord Kelvin uh William Thompson had calculated that uh using the most advanced energy source he knew of which was coal uh if the sun was made of coal it should burn for somewhere between 25 and 50,000 years so that seemed really you know wonderful great it's it's plenty enough time that that explains why the sun can burn as long but during this period in the early 1900s, we were discovering things like, uh, well, plate tectonics, sort of, but not really. It was more like the stuff we were getting from biology. Uh, it looked like species were related across the ocean, uh, but in such a weird way that they would have had to have been uh, alive for maybe hundreds of thousands of years. We were finding that uh, things were moving and in, in, uh, in on the planet and in space in such a way that suggested maybe the universe might be, you know, 100,000, 200,000 years old. And different sciences were reaching this conclusion, but that left a big gap. What, how, how is that the case if the sun's only gonna burn for 25 to 50,000 years? But Einstein introduces E equals MC squared. And a guy by the name of Hans Beth, uh, also called Beta, uh, he actually gives us a model that helps us understand from a nuclear physics standpoint exactly what goes on inside the core of the sun. And it turns out that basically uh, four hydrogen atoms, which is basically four protons, but they're at such a high energy, none of them have their electrons anymore. So they're four protons. Two of them run into each other. One spontaneously turns from a proton into a neutron. So you got a proton-neutron pair there which is actually called deuterium. That's a heavy part of heavy water. Deuterium can be uh, one proton and one neutron, whereas tritium would be one proton and two neutrons. Uh, and then all of them are hydrogen, of course. Now, later on, one of those will cancel, uh, hit with another. And then that will spontaneously turn into a helium nucleus, which is two protons and two neutrons and puts out all these uh, uh, neutrinos and it puts out anti electrons and uh, gamma rays and stuff like that. Uh, but that mechanism is how the sun works. And if you add up all those masses, it turns out that the product, even with the little individual particles that are being created, like positrons and neutrinos, which we uh, think must have some mass, uh, even if you take those into account, it turns out the mass difference between four protons and a helium nucleus is significant. And if you take that mass difference and multiply it by C squared, you get the actual energy put out by one of those reactions. And if you take that energy and divide it into the amount of energy put out by our sun per second, for instance, then you get the number of reactions that must be occurring every second. And if you look at that and say, well, you know, how much hydrogen is actually in the sun and how much can burn, it tells us our sun is going to be about 10,000 uh, or about 10 billion years old is what it will live to. So that's another thing Einstein did. Uh, he also, 10 years later, uh, basically introduces the general theory of relativity, which gets rid of that word inertia. And in fact, all you have to change in the special theory of relativity is get rid of the word inertia. And you say the laws of physics are the same for all observers and the speed of light is a constant independent of the motion of the source and independent of the motion of the observer. What that first law does in, in general relativity basically just says that the laws of physics are the same for all observers. That means any, any equation you come up with for your particular uh, reference point will be exactly the same form as it is for anybody else's reference point. And that tells you to look for something we now call covariance, which is basically that there's a nice conversion uh from one coordinate system to another and uh basically tells you to, to use things called tensors which are like a, a, a more advanced version of a vector and that's what Einstein spent most of his time doing was trying to learn that stuff which he was fortunate enough to have had a class on when he was in college but he sort of goofed off and didn't learn it so he had to go back and speak with some of his older friends to get help on that but he eventually just came up with the laws of of general relativity and and I'll tell you more about that later so how do you actually make use of something like those two principles, the principles of relativity? The first one is that the laws of physics are the same for all inertial observers. That just means that, you know, hey, your view or my view are both right. Okay. 
if you're using the coordinate system, like I'm standing out here in my, uh, my uh, front yard and I'm looking at the road, naturally looking at the road, anything going in my case south, uh, which is to my right, is going to be the positive direction. And you guys, if you're standing across the street from me, you'd say the natural position of the positive x-axis would be to your right, which is in fact north. So that's okay. That means whatever laws of physics you get, uh, even though you think north is positive and I think south is positive, should be exactly the same. Okay. So that's that's part of it. That's where the relativity part comes in, where the answer that one person gets is not any better than the answer that another person gets. The speed of light is the part that allows us to actually implement it. So I'm going to give you a, a derivation and then we're going to talk about the ramification of that uh, as follows. So it turns out that if you uh, want to make something uh, tell you some laws of nature or tell you some some things about the way nature behaves by using the principle of the constancy of the speed of light, you have to implement something using light. So what Einstein did was he created a clock using light. He said, okay, let's imagine a clock as, you know, a clock is basically anything that repeats itself in a set amount of quote unquote time. So Einstein imagined you have a little light bulb or a flashlight or whatever, and you turn that on for a split second and it shoots a beam of light and then you allow it to hit a certain distance away a mirror and then it's going to bounce off that mirror and come right back and then you pick it back up and that should be a unit of time say delta t right so that's that's a, a good clock and you could call that unit of time a click so maybe it made a noise when the when the photon came back in that's certainly fine right so uh, that's what we're going to use in a train car to make sense of relativity and actually find a result that's kind of weird. So let's try sharing my screen real quick. Looks like it's working this time. So how do we do this? So I'm going to imagine a train. And I want to start with a nice little train car. Uh, I think I want to go a little further than that. Like that. Okay. And now I'm going to put little wheels on it. Like that. And now I'm going to draw it again a little later in time. And evidently, my iPad decided that some of those wheels need to be square and elliptical. So we're just going to go with that. And then I'm going to draw it again a little later in time as well. Well, that did not go well. Well, that was bad, too. I don't even know why I put time into actually having it correct my drawings if it doesn't do any better than that. <laughs> These square wheels are killing me. So what we're going to have in here is our little flashlight at the bottom and then our mirror at the top, flashlight at the bottom, mirror at the top, flashlight at the bottom, mirror at the top. And this is us watching our friend ride by on a train. Okay. The leftmost one happens at one instant the middle one is a little bit of time later and the last one is a little bit of time later still okay and what we know is this train is going to be moving at a velocity say v okay and that's supposed to be horizontal but anyways that's the velocity v now what's going to happen from our perspective not from the perspective of the person on the train but from our perspective sitting at you know the side of the train tracks watching this train go by we're going to see the light leave this camera or this excuse me flashlight and it's going to hit the mirror over there then it's going to leave that mirror and come back and hit the flashlight back over here and that's what we're going to be calling one unit of time like i said before that might be a click but that's a click measured by us in other words, measured by us means measured by people who see the clock moving. And it turns out there's a 
uh, idea that you can use to keep your wits about you when dealing with relativity. And the idea is called the proper, in this case, proper time. And proper time is time measured. Listen to this closely. Proper time is time measured by someone who doesn't see their clock moving with respect to them. Okay. In other words, they see uh, the beginning of the event, the middle of the event, and the end of the event all occur at the exact same point in their coordinate system. So you can imagine a person sitting right next to that uh, light, lamp, uh, light clock, and that would make perfect sense because obviously the people riding in the train, uh, they're not moving in their frame. So if the you know light bulb, for instance, was right next to their right hip, it's going to stay next to their right hip for all of these parts. Now, what we know is that if I draw this triangle right here, I know this triangle has a very specific length. And that length is basically the velocity of the train times the time we measure for the whole trip divided by two. So that's going to be V delta T over two. So that's this leg of the triangle. Now this leg of the triangle, however, is going to be different. That leg of the triangle is going to be basically, again, velocity times time, okay? So in this case, the clock is going to have a photon that leaves the bottom, and let's say this length right here is big L from here to here, okay? If we do that, then we'll say that that length right there is L, and that should be C times delta T over two. Does that make sense? So uh, in other words, the speed of light is going to be uh, velocity, which is a distance divided by time. So if you want to know time, you divide the distance divided by, uh, or if you want to know distance, you multiply the velocity times time. So that's what we did there. So in fact, what we get is this right here is the actual distance traveled by the beam of light. Okay. So what the beam of light actually does is moves this way. And in fact, the distance that the light travels, uh, let's call that not L, let's call that D. D is equal to the square root using the Pythagorean theorem of V delta T over two squared plus C delta T over two squared. Okay. Now in the person on the train's frame, what they see is a light beam goes up and bounces back and a light beam comes back down like this. And they see that the distance uh, L zero, say that's, that's them. They don't see that distance moving. So that's going to turn out to be a uh, proper length, just like the delta T uh, that they measure is going to be a proper time. So they actually determine the distance, uh, the time taken for this, or I should say uh, the L zero is going to be C, whoa, C times delta T over two. And this, this is their time. So that's delta T zero. Okay, so that's that's how this works out for them. They have two uh, different perspectives and the perspective from the train, we see that the beam of light goes straight up, straight down and that sort of thing. Now, uh, the distance uh, in, the, in the way we see it, we see it going diagonally up and to the right, okay? So uh, what it turns out to be is that the distance traveled or the time that we measure, say, so the time that we measure delta T is basically just the distance traveled divided by, uh, or excuse me, yes, it's the distance traveled divided by the speed. So we know this distance is gonna be square root V delta T over two squared 
plus C delta T over two quantity squared again. That's the distance traveled. And that's going to be divided by the speed of light. So that's going to be divided by C. Now for, uh, and that's going to be the total time uh, from here. Let me put it in black. So this will let you know that's the time for us seeing it going from here to here. Similarly, delta T2, or delta T0, I should say, that's going to be the total distance traveled, which is C delta T0 over 2, divided by the velocity. So that's how long you on the train or whoever's on the train uh, thinks that one click of time is. It's C delta T over 2 divided by C. So if we wish to, or excuse me, that's C delta T zero over 2. Yes, yes. Okay. So if we try to uh, make use of this, we can actually uh, solve, for instance, for one of these terms and put it in terms of the other and, and all that good stuff. And actually, I just sort of lost myself in where I was going with deriving this. Luckily, y'all can look at special relativity 001 uh, to see cleanly what's going on. I don't, I don't know why, but all of a sudden, I just sort of lost my train of thought. Uh, but what I've said so far is all correct. So we, we're seeing that the people on the side of the track sees it going, uh, sees the beam of light going up that diagonal, whose length I said was sort of, I guess, actually D. And then the distance traveled is uh, in a time delta t is actually twice that divided by two. Ooh, so that, that's one thing. Let's let's put that two in there. So the the time that uh, we see pass by is two times that d divided by c, and the time that the that the person in the train car sees pass by is two times that divided by the speed of light. Okay. So uh, we could, in principle, use that. We could, for instance, uh, say, I don't know, I, you know, it's like a, I really should look back over this because I didn't, I haven't done this since last week and uh, I may have made a boo-boo. But anyway, let's, let's try to think for a second what C delta T and all that good stuff does. So I'm going to say uh, delta T. No, I don't want that. Let's, I'm trying to figure out a way to get there from this. And I know that expression works, but don't know how. Okay, let's let's say we're going to solve for this little C here and just see what happens. It might work out. If it doesn't, it's okay. You can look at my special relativity 001, which I put a link on. Uh, you can say that C, in fact, which has to be according to relativity, uh, C does not change because you're in a different reference frame. So in this case, uh, if I take equation one and equation two, one is going to tell me that C is equal to uh, two square root V delta T over two squared plus C delta T over two squared uh, divided by delta T. And two tells us that C is equal to, and this is really weird. If it works out, I'm just going to be amazed. But anyways, it should be, the twos cancel out there, so I get C delta T. That's just obviously, if I get that, that's just going to be C. So that's probably not going to be very helpful at all. Uh, C is equal to C delta T zero over delta T zero. Yeah, that's kind of a bummer. That's just C equals C. So yeah, that definitely didn't work. Uh, the time's right there to see. Okay, I'll tell you what we're going to do. We're going to take this equation, which I'm going to call equation three now. And I'm going to take uh, that equation two. So from two, I find that C delta T zero over two is actually equal to, uh, oh, Excuse me, I don't want to do that. And plus I made a writing error there too. From two. I don't think that's good. Okay, how about this? 
speed up the T over two is definitely what they see. Uh, but yeah, I tell you what, I'm gonna because I've, I've him and Holland here. Let me give you the result. The result is that this time that we measure uh, watching the train goes by, delta T. That going that's going to turn out to be delta T zero over the square root of one minus V over C. That quantity is squared. Um, sorry, I didn't. I thought I was prepared enough to rehash this in real time, having done it like Wednesday of last week, but evidently it's not. Uh, I've forgotten something or started somewhere funny. So anyways, this is the ultimate result. Uh, but it turns out you can write it a little easier if we make some definitions. For instance, we can define V over C is defined to be the quantity beta. And then gamma is defined to be the quantity of one over the square root of one minus beta squared. So you can rewrite this as delta T is equal to gamma delta T zero. And this is called time dilation. Does anybody know what dilation means? Does that mean to get bigger or to get smaller? Get bigger. Get bigger, yes. And that's sort of important because first time I heard it, I didn't realize that. <laughs> so uh, I was like in you know, like middle school, I was like, oh, that's weird. But uh, yeah, so dilation means getting bigger. And what that means is, according to someone who says clock is a clock is moving, that moving clock runs slowly. Now that, that might sound weird with getting bigger, but what we mean by that is uh, what a person uh, riding down the road with a clock that we see is moving says is five minutes. We're gonna say, no, you're a crazy fool. That's 10 minutes, right? That's what we mean. So that's time dilation. Uh, moving clocks. move or let's say move more slowly which doesn't uh doesn't help too much let's say move more slowly so what i mean by that is the second hand progresses from the 12 back through the six and back up to the 12 again in a longer period of time so uh five minutes for the passenger could mean 10 minutes for us. Now, here's the weird thing, and this is the part where the laws of physics are the same for all inertial observers. Uh, we're going to tell the person in the train car riding by us, hey, your five-minute interval actually took 10 minutes. And he's going to say, hey, uh, your five-minute interval actually took 10 minutes. And we're both right. Okay, because from his perspective, He's just sitting there on a train and the earth is rolling by under him at, uh, it turns out to be 86.6% of the speed of light. If, if you want the uh, change to be a factor of two, like happened here, I went from five minutes to two minutes as a factor of two. So that's what time dilation is. I'm sorry I screwed up on the derivation. The main thing is the equation. Uh, the derivation is fun. Uh, I, this is the first time I've actually botched it like that, but uh, I, I know everything that I wrote in there was right, but I, I just can't for the life of me figure out where I was going with it. Uh, so anyways, we'll figure that out some other time. Or you can look at special relativity 001, which I put a link in in, in the module for, for both my night class that's happening right now, as well as my students that uh, are attending that were supposed to be here, uh, meeting me today at lecture. So we've got that. Now, what does that tell us? Well, that's one of the things that Basically, you know, I told you Einstein won the Nobel Prize for the photoelectric effect. He didn't win it for relativity because some people didn't really think he knew what he was talking about when it came to relativity. <laughs> okay. Uh, they, they, you know, it seemed really odd to them. It wasn't that complicated mathematically, but there were some issues with it uh, that they just, you know, hadn't quite grasped. So it didn't immediately hit. Einstein knew it was right. Uh, and a lot of people that knew Einstein knew it was right as well. And a lot of people that he interacted with knew it was right. Uh, but when re general relativity finally gets along, uh, gets around, which is around 1915, he publishes it. And then by 1916, it's confirmed. Uh, 
by that time, everybody knew to not underestimate Einstein, and they were quite confident it would work. Uh, uh, but everybody knew relativity by then, too, is, was a, a, a new bastion of physics or a new paradigm of physics that we had to deal with. Uh, but he could point to some evidence. It was just really hard to come by. So, for instance, we just recently, and I say recently, it was maybe two decades ago, uh, took a Concorde, or excuse me, a, a, is it, yes, Concorde, the French the French jet that's no longer working. That was the fastest uh, public use aircraft uh, in existence was the the uh, French jet, the Concorde, it was, had a bent nose and stuff like that, but it was really the fastest commuter uh, commuter aircraft uh, that, that everyday people got to use. In other words, we suspect various militaries have faster vehicles, but uh, they don't necessarily tell us they do. But it would go very, very fast. And in fact, we've had since then, or, or by that time, we had managed to measure speed, or excuse me, measure time uh, to like 12 decimal places. Uh, and the problem with this special theory of relativity and specifically time dilation, you see that you have that beta in there. That's velocity divided by the speed of light. Uh, the speed of light is 186,000 miles every second. That might not give you a good appreciation of how big that is. But it's also another way of thinking about it is light is fast enough to go around the equator of the Earth eight times in a single second or it's fast enough to almost make it from the moon to the earth in a single second. It's really fast. Now, if you want to think about that, it's actually the speed of light. I've written this for you before, but the speed of light is exactly 299,792,458.0 with a bar over it meters per second and that's because we've now defined the unit of time to be something very precise it's basically cesium-137 a specific uh transition of a uh nucleus of, of cesium-137 there's a nuclear transition that occurs many many times per second and when a certain number of them and it's literally on the order of hundreds of millions of times when a hundred millions of those uh uh, hyper or those transitions have occurred, one second has passed. So if you have a device that can detect every one of those that occurs and it keeps count, every time it hits that magical number, that's now defined to be exactly one second. And then when you find that out, you say, okay, well, uh, let's say the meter is defined to be the distance light travels in one over uh, 299,792,458 of a second. OK, when you do that, then the speed of light is exactly that number. And that's how we have it now. So what is that? Well, that is a pretty big number. But if you want to think of it in miles, which a lot of us Americans do, that's one hundred and sixty one. Thousand. Uh, oh, that's not right. It's one hundred eighty six thousand. Sorry, I was looking at something else. I know it's 186. I already told you that. It's 186,282.397 miles per second. Or it's in fact, if you want to go to miles per hour, it's 670 million, 616,000. Uh, 629 miles per hour. So that's that's pretty fast. I think we all agree that that's kind of fast, right? So that's the speed of light. It's very big. And if you take a normal speed, uh, even one for like spacecraft that we use, like Hayabusa, which Hayabusa was a uh, aircraft that went so fast that it could make it from the Earth to the Moon and something like on the order of hours, whereas our uh, Apollo mission took two weeks, I think, and I think they took a week, actually. So that was super fast. But if you divide that by the speed of light, you get like 0 0.001 or something. So our 0 0.0002 or something. So it's really, really small. So you don't really see this relativistic effect easily. You have to be able to see it with things like Concords and, and uh, atomic clocks. So sure enough, a couple of decades ago, we took an atomic clock and we basically tracked his motion very precisely. 
we took the t- atomic clock and we put it on a Concorde jet. Uh, we precisely monitored what the Concorde jet was doing. And when Con- Concorde jet took off, you know, reaching, going from zero speed to some other speed to some other speed, and then finally getting up to its max speed and flew around the planet and then came back and landed. And relativity predicted that that clock would be off by a very specific amount. And we found out that it was off by exactly that same amount that uh, Einstein's special theory of relativity had done. So that was uh, some pretty easy but brute force calculation to determine whether special relativity was right. Uh, We had other evidence at the time, though. For instance, we were detecting what's called uh, muons. Uh, they used to call them mesons, but that's wrong. Okay, we just got that wrong. But if there's a particle called a, a muon, which is like a uh, heavy electron. Uh, it has a negative charge, but it has a very short lifetime. So it's it's actually created in our upper atmosphere uh, by solar radiation hitting uh, molecules in our upper atmosphere. And when it's created, it comes out at like, you know, 90% of the speed of light or something got awfully large like that. So uh, having such a short lifetime, which is on the order of, you know, a microsecond, for instance, it's created at the upper atmosphere. And then uh, we detect it hitting the surface of the earth. Well, that's all well and good, except if you take its speed, which is, say, 0.90 times 299,792,458 meters per second, uh, you, get a, you get a distance that is too small uh, to account for it coming from the upper atmosphere to the surface of the Earth. In other words, that distance, uh, C times 0.9 times its lifetime, is actually smaller than the thickness of our atmosphere. So that's a problem. How, how is this muon created in our upper atmosphere? How is that possibly making it to the surface of the Earth? Well, guess what? Time dilation. For us, we realize this particle is moving really, really fast. So its life clock, which might be like 1.25 microseconds in length, meaning it's going to be born and then 1.25 microseconds later, it'll be dead. That clock is moving really, really slow for us because that muon is moving. So if we apply the time dilation for formula to it, its time is the proper time, the delta T zero, because to it, it was born and it dies at the exact same place, right? It, right there itself. <laughs> so that's the definition of proper time is time that sees the beginning and the end of the event at, the, at their same point in space in their same coordinate system, say. So uh, the muon said, I'm existing right here in the center of myself, and then I can stop existing right here in the center of myself. So this time interval began and ended at the exact same point in my coordinate system. So I've got proper time. So I multiply proper time by the gamma factor. If the gamma factor was something like 10, then my life would be not 1.25 times 10 to the negative six seconds, but 12.5 times 10 to the negative six seconds. And that could give it a long enough life to make it to the surface of the earth. And in fact, it was fast enough when you take into account relativity to make it to the surface of the earth. But if you don't take into account relativity, it's not fast enough. So that's kind of neat. Uh, if you play with this a little bit, so you, you see what the formulas are. It's really nice to use gamma and beta, by the way. What we have here is delta T. the time measured by someone who thinks the clock is moving is equal to delta T zero over the square root of one minus beta squared. That's another way of writing it. And like I said, that's the same thing as writing gamma delta T zero. Now, if you want to realize that gamma is one over the square root of one minus beta squared, then you can solve for beta. And this is an exercise I'm doing intentionally here. I'm going to square both sides. I'll get gamma squared is equal to one over one minus beta squared. I'm gonna multiply both sides by one minus beta squared. So I'm multiplying this one and this one. And of course, when I get that, I get one minus beta squared times gamma squared is equal to one. Now I'm gonna divide both sides by gamma squared. And when I do that, I get one minus beta squared is equal to one over gamma squared. Now I'm going to solve for beta and I'm going to get beta is equal to one minus one over gamma squared square root, which if I get a common denominator, that can make it a little nicer. I can say that's the square root of gamma squared 
minus one over, and this square root is going to go all the way down here, over gamma square, squared, which gives me the square root of gamma squared minus one over gamma. So that's a nice way for us to determine, hey, how fast do I need to go if I want a specific gamma? Like uh, you can, you know, I've been talking about two minute intervals here, five minute intervals and stuff like that. Uh, if you want a certain change in time, if you want time to be increased by say a factor of three, you plug in gamma equals three in this and that would tell you what fraction of the speed of light. That's what beta is, it's the fraction of the speed of light. It would tell you what fraction of the speed of light uh, you have to travel to get a gamma factor of say three. So for instance, if I want gamma equals two, that's the five minute, becomes 10 minute, then I get beta is equal to, and I think you'll see this pretty quickly, two squared minus one over two. Two squared is four, four minus one is three, and that's root three over two, which is why I told you it's 0 0.86605 or about 86.6% of the speed of light. So that's a really nice thing. Now, I'll tell you, there's also another derivation that'll come in handy because you, you got to look at it this way. So I'm going to give you a little bit more information than I originally planned. I usually do just this and then talk about some ramifications. But uh, since I got a little bit extra time from not doing the derivation and stopping it in the middle of while I screwed up, uh, we can talk about the other factors. So one of the neat things you guys might think about, hopefully you've already thought about it, but I'm not, uh, I'm not sure you have. It's also perfectly normal for you not to have. Uh, but, you know, really, really thinking people might have come up with this. I don't think I would have when I was at your age, so don't feel bad. Uh, but I just told you how the muon makes it to the surface of the Earth. From our perspective, it's clear. But what, what does the muon think? Because in the muon's frame, it's got to agree because, you know, it remembered that his life ended with hitting the surface of the Earth and then he died, Right. So they both have to agree, the muon and us have to agree that uh, the muon made it from the upper atmosphere to the surface of the Earth. But in the muon's frame, the muon's not moving, so time dilation uh, doesn't happen. In fact, what he sees is everybody else is seeing his lifetime as being uh, a lot longer than it is. So can anybody think and I'll give you a little hint, the velocity, uh, which is the speed of light, C, that is like all velocities, it's the distance traveled divided by time taken. And that's a constant, independent of the motion of the source, independent of the motion of the observer. So distance divided by time is a constant. I've just shown you that the time can change, right? So can anybody think what has to happen in order for us to explain or in order for the the muon say to explain how it hits the surface of the earth anybody come up with something like that give you a little time to think about that Nobody comes up with anything? I'm trying to erase something to make this a little less crappy. Nobody? Okay. So as I hinted at, the speed of light's a constant. We just said that speed is distance divided by time, and I just showed you an instance where time was sort of altered. So if time's altered, doesn't it make sense that, that distance can be altered as well? And in fact, you probably guess, well, hey, if I'm going to alter distance such that the uh, such that the muon agrees that it made it to the surface of the Earth, the muon must think it went a, far, a smaller distance than it really went. So you're already thinking, okay, so the muon sees the Earth moving to him, so he thinks moving objects actually get smaller. And that's exactly what it is. And the other result is, in fact, uh, L is equal to L zero over gamma. Notice the other one had the zero times gamma. This one has the gear, the zero or the O above gamma.
Okay. This is called length contraction. Contraction, which is the opposite of dilation. And what it tells us is that moving objects look shorter. So a Crown Vic, which is the big car that uh, police cars used to uh, be, they would be a lot of places with back Crown Vicks and or a lot of cities with back Crown Vicks uh, because they could come with a big engine and they were big, so they were weighty, uh, so they could easily you know bump people off of roads uh, they, and stuff like that. When you're trying to pull someone, you could you could beef up their suspension. So they bought these Crown Vicks and they were really these big long cars. In fact, uh, I once had a girlfriend that had one and she called it a cruise ship because it was so big and long. But anyways, uh, the the Crown Vic, if it goes really fast, let's say 86.6% of the speed of light, it's going to shrink by a factor of two. So this car that might have been, say, 12 feet long is now like six feet long. And in fact, you'll see one of the examples I put uh, on my YouTube channel is actually a, a example of making a Lamborghini look like a Volkswagen Beetle. Because a Lamborghini and a Volkswagen Beetle are pretty close to the same height. But a Lamborghini is really, really long. And if you go fast enough with the Lamborghini, the height doesn't change at all because that's a direction that's perpendicular to the to the motion. So directions perpendicular to the motion don't get contracted or dilated or anything like that. So the Volkswagen, I mean, the, the Lamborghini gets shorter and shorter in length, even though its height is about the same. Uh, and in fact, you say, okay, well, that's kind of cool. And it doesn't really take that great of a speed. I mean, it takes greater than we do because we're not, you know, approaching more than maybe 1% of the speed of light with our fastest stuff right now. But it doesn't take that huge of a speed to get the Lamborghini to be the same length as a Volkswagen Beetle from the 1966 era. I'm not talking about this new Beetle. I'm talking about the 1966 one. So if you do that, that's kind of neat. But then you might think, oh, wait a second now. It looks like it. And now not only that, the Lamborghini, which had this really smooth 22 degree uh, windshield, that still looks kind of sporty compared to the Beetle. The Volkswagen Beetle had a, a 60 degree windshield like like that. So you might say, OK, well, how fast do I have to go to make the windshield of a Lamborghini just as uh, steep as the windshield of a Volkswagen Beetle? And it turns out that one's quite fast. So that's some of the kind of neat stuff you can do. Uh, what I recommend you guys do, I'm going to stop sharing this right now and I'm going to show you something kind of cool. I'm going to share a different screen. I'm going to share this one right here. This is a nice, nice, neat thing you guys can make. You can uh, make it and turn it in to me if you want for extra credit. But this is an Excel spreadsheet where I've taken, uh, basically what I do is I, I fill in boxes that you can put numbers in. I fill them in with blue paint, you know, so like I use that thing right there and make it blue. So these areas right here are where I can plug in numbers. So if I wanted to find what the beta factor or what the gamma factor uh, of 20 requires as far as speed. So let's say I want I want a one minute, uh, let's say bagel. Let's say I eat a bagel and it takes a minute. If I want a one minute bagel to last 20 minutes, then I want my gamma factor to be 20. So I can type in 20 here and lo and behold, it'll tell me the speed. Well, the beta means I gotta go 99.874% of the speed of light. That's what this quantity says. And if I wanted to know what that is in meters per second, that's 299,417,483 meters per second or 186,049 uh, miles per second or 669, uh, ooh, that's actually bigger than that, 669,777,834 miles per hour, right? So that's all stuff you can do. Or if I just wanted to know the proper time, I could say, let's say the proper, I want the proper time to be uh, five, I'm going to say seconds. And technically, I don't have to put any units in here because whatever units I put in, they're going to automatically come out. So even though I put seconds up there, just know it can be anything. So if I put that there, you say, oh, okay. Well, if my proper time is five seconds at 20 uh, gamma factor or beta, that's going to give me 100 dilated minutes. In other words, a five minute, uh, ice cream cone. Let's say we did this experiment where we took a thousand ice cream cones and we made them all identical. And then we measured how long it took till they completely melted, not with any eating. They just melted till the ice cream became level with the top of the sugar cone, say. Uh, we determined to a great deal of precision and accuracy that that was a five minute process. Okay. 
So now we put some of those on a spacecraft and we say, okay, let's let the spacecraft move at this 0.99875 times the speed of light. And let's see how long they last for us watching them fly by at that huge speed of 99.875% of the speed of light. And what we would find is that those ice creams are now lasting 100 minutes. And if we had, in fact, ice creams uh, that, that were given to us at the same instant, the people on the spacecraft could do the same experiment with us and say, hey, look at those guys over there. They're going by, you know, we're going north uh, or, or we're sitting here uh, and they think we're going north. But in fact, what's really going on is they're going south. So they're thinking, oh, look at those people headed south. They're traveling at 99.875 times the speed of light. Uh, or 99.875% of the speed of light. And their ice creams, which I know because I remember doing the experiments, are five minutes long, but they're taking 100 minutes. Okay. So this is a nice, neat little spreadsheet you can make. It, it allows you to check your answers really quick when you're doing a lot of calculations. It keeps you from having to, to always plug it back in the calculator. Uh, it keeps you from making careless mistakes and stuff like that. But what I did was you can see... Uh, I put in a bunch of different values of, of gamma, and you can probably see a pattern here that I think is really nice. For instance, I did one through 10 because I wanted to know all those factors. Obviously, gamma being one means nothing happens, but gamma being two, there's 86.603. Actually, I said 605 earlier. Uh, that's what the square root of three over two is. Uh, root three is 0.9428. Uh, remember, I said root three over two was 0 0.8660. But if I wanted the gamma to be three, that's 94.28%. Or if I wanted gamma to be four, that's 96.82%. Uh, but when I got to 10, I did 20 and I did 50. But really, I wanted to go by powers of 10 from there on out. So check this out. The power of 10, I go 99.5 roughly percent of speed of light. But if I go from 10 to 100, I go 99995. And if I go to 1,000, I go 9999995. So what you see is you get two values of 9 followed by 5 for each power of 10 that you want. So that's a nice pattern uh, if you ever want to figure out gamma factors really quickly. Two, power, two iterations of 9 followed by a 5 for each power of 10 you go. And, of course, if you don't go... To that particular power of 10, you just keep doing the nine. So you do two nines, but you always end in a five. So uh, 10,000, for instance, 10,000, we can see right here, note right here, 10,000, that's four powers of 10. So I expect eight nines and a five. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, eight powers of, uh, of nine and then a five. So yep or eight iterations of nine and a five. So that's how that works. This is a really neat thing. And of course, once you get to this high, uh, this thing's not even given enough uh, data points to tell us uh, what it is beyond, you know, 12 decimal places. But anyways, that's a nice little spreadsheet you make. Uh, if you want to see how I made it, well, you look here, you can say, well, Mr. Younger showed me how to solve gamma, uh, solve for beta and the gamma factor. And it turned out to be the square root of gamma squared minus one. Hey, that's exactly what that is. That's A3, which is gamma squared minus one divided by, or taking the square root of all that, and then divide that by A3 again. And then you copy that down and that gets all this. And then I use these, like I said, I just put one, two, three, four, five, and, but I colored it blue to let everybody know, hey, this is where you can fill stuff in. Uh, also, I did another one here where uh, not only that, I, after I did the, determination of beta for a given gamma, I said, well, it's interesting to know what that beta is in meters per second. So that's what's here. So I just am basically computing the speed of light uh, times beta. And I put the speed of light down here in B28. And all I have to do is multiply this beta times it, and that'll give me it in meters per second. So B3 times dollar sign B dollar sign 28 gives me what 86.6% of the speed of light is in meters per second. And then I did another conversion right here. That's where I take the result that I got in meters per second and I convert it to miles per second. And then I did it again where I convert it to miles per hour. And in fact, for the speed of light, I just copied the same formula down and got the speed of light uh, in those speeds. So that's how I was reading that stuff off to you. Uh, I also did dilated time where someone puts in the proper time and then gets a dilated time. So if I say I want my proper time to be 100, 
then the proper times or the dilated time is going to be five. That's exactly right. And you can put in the, co the contracted length if you want the contracted, or you can put in the proper length if you want the proper length to be, uh, let's say for this one again, let's say this is 30. That might be 30 meters, that might be 30 miles, doesn't matter. The main thing is the contracted length is going to be down to 1.5 for that. Okay. And you'll also see that that's, of course, 30 divided by 20, but that's all it is. Okay. So this gamma factor appears so much in, in relativity that a table like this is super handy to have. So like I said, you guys are, are completely welcome to make this. I encourage it and use it for your homework, you know, to save you some work if you want. But the main thing is uh, you get extra credit for it and you get a little bit of practice uh, doing relativity stuff. And you can quickly put in a new column whenever you learn something new. For instance, I'm going to teach you next. Let's stop sharing this for a second. I'm next going to teach you that most stuff looks sort of the same in relativity versus uh versus you know newtonian physics but there are differences so for instance momentum which we define to be p equals mass i know i'm not sharing this yet but i'm going to uh <laughs> momentum which we define to be as mass times velocity is not exactly mass times velocity it turns out if you try to do that uh you don't get the laws of physics working out properly so einstein had to actually uh change that a little bit it turns out this goes to P is equal to gamma times MV. And that's just one dimensional. It's a lot more complicated if you happen to consider what the momentum is uh, in any arbitrary direction for a velocity in any arbitrary direction. What we're doing here is we're saying the velocity is right along the x-axis and you want to know what's the x component of momentum. Well, we're just going to say gamma times MV. Again, remembering that gamma is one over the square root of one minus beta squared and that beta is equal to v over c so that's another thing it turns out also kinetic energy was equal to one half mv squared which also equals p squared over 2m that's another way we do it but it turns out in relativity gamma uh, i mean kinetic energy is in fact gamma minus one times mc squared and you get some other crazy stuff where E squared's equal to P squared, C squared, plus M squared, C to the fourth. So these are all valid equations that you can use. And I'm not taking time to derive them. I'm just giving them to you. And you don't really need to derive them. The important thing is that you uh, need to be able to use them. Uh, this tells you, for instance, that the total energy of an object, E, is given by E squared is equal to the momentum of the object squared times the square of the speed of light plus what we call the rest mass squared, uh, the rest energy. The rest energy, we can say E rest, this is the famous thing that Einstein wrote, is equal to MC squared. That turns out to be the rest energy that any particle has. In other words, it's 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 many things, but one thing it says that if you could vaporize a mass of say one kilogram, then that one kilogram mass would instantly become energy, and the amount of energy you'd get would be about nine times ten to the sixteenth joules, which is a buttload of energy. Trust me. So a kilogram of matter converted to energy would be nine times ten to the sixteenth joules. That's a lot of energy. And not only that, it's actually bigger than that. The uh, E equals MC squared is not just about, you know, what's the particle's energy when it's sitting still. It turns out that every bit of energy we run into is a result of MC squared. What do I mean by that? Well, imagine this. Imagine you take a car. This is a kind of a convoluted story, so you got to pay close attention. We only got like one minute left. But you take a car and you uh, clean out the carburetors, clean out uh, the all everywhere the gas is going to go. You clean it pristinely, pristinely clear, and then you weigh a certain amount of gas, say 40 gallons of gas. You weigh it very precisely, and you pour it into the gas tank, and then you drive it until uh, until it completely runs out. And then you go through and you, you've actually, while, while driving it, you've captured all the exhaust, all the heat that's put out, all that stuff like that, uh, and you've 
accounted for all the energy that's been delivered to the car via the explosions that happen in the tank, okay? Well, if you take that mass of the gas and compare that to the mass of all the stuff that came out, meaning like all the exhaust gas and all the debris that you had to clean out again from the gas tank and from the carburetor and fuel lines and all that stuff, you, if you compare those masses, they are not going to be equal to each other. In fact, they're going to be uh, the mass of, of everything after, after the drive is actually going to be considerably smaller than the total mass of the gas. And it's going to be smaller by an amount uh, E over C squared, where E is the total energy that the car got from blowing up the gas in the cylinders, plus the heat it put out and all that stuff. So if you took all that energy, the energy that the car got from, from the gas tank, as well as the energy that was put out as heat, and you add up all those sources and you divide it by C squared, that'd be exactly how much mass difference there would be. So that's what I mean by the, uh, the E equals MC squared is always true. It's not just true sometimes. Binding energy of, of atoms is basically E equals MC squared. When you weigh a, a nucleus of an atom, it weighs less than the sum of the masses of the parts that made it up. And that's because the energy that binds it is given by MC squared. Okay. So that's it. I think you've got enough actually to do, be honest with you, to do about 90% of the homework problems. The only thing I really didn't give you is I didn't give you the Lorentz transformation equations, which I could. I mean, it's, it's really easy, uh, but I've given you enough to do everything but the Lorentz transformation equations and the Doppler effect. Uh, I, oh, I didn't give you the addition of velocities formula. We're going to do the addition of velocities formula and uh, the Lorentz equations next time. But you're basically in a good spot to you, you can do essentially almost all the homework. If you want to quickly look up those equations, you can do the other ones uh, related to that stuff. It's really not that hard in applying it, uh, but I'll do more. I'll do examples next time. You'll see some examples on my YouTube uh, channel, as well as examples that I worked in the uh, links already put up there. But you guys are free to go, and I thank you all for coming. I'm going to wait for the last person to leave, uh, so you guys can ask me as many questions as you want, including my people from the day class that didn't get to see me. Y'all might not understand the lab. I'll be glad to go over that or anything else. So. Thanks for coming, everyone. Have a good evening. Thank you, Jamie. Michaela, you still here? There I am. You are cool. Just want to make in case you had any questions, I want to make sure you had you had a chance to ask me. Yes, I do. Um for that car question you were just talking about um and you said the different sources of energy like the explosions going on from the engine and everything mm -hmm. so energy that's lost like i guess it would be considered um lost as heat due to friction when the tires are meeting the road that's not considered within the system of the car, right? Yeah, because even that one's funny. considered because the, the engine's got to overcome that friction. Oh, okay. So every bit, yeah, you'd have to count for all that energy, but notice it's going to be divided by C squared. So you want to get as much as you can so you can even measure it. But, uh, you know, C squared is nine times 10 to the 16. So that means we're, we're going to have to uh, be measuring to the 16th decimal place unless the, the energy is really huge. Wow, that's interesting. Yeah, it's kind of cool. But I mean, even simple things like if you take the amount of food uh, that you intake in a day and then you say compare it to all the, the stuff you give off during the day, you know, going to the bathroom and all that sort of stuff. Uh, scientists did that for a long time around the time of Newton, and they kept finding that matter was conserved. Well, that's because they didn't have, you know, 16 decimal places to work with if they did. Uh, they would have found out that, uh, in fact, no, we're, we're losing mass because we're actually sending heat out at being at 98.6 degrees Fahrenheit being our body temperature. That heat is radiating out. Uh, in order for us to put out that energy, some mass has to be lost, and that mass is given by the heat we put out divided by C squared. All right. Okay. Um, for Crazy. the lab to do... Um, the lab that you told us about over the email, right? Um, are we able to do that 
like say if somebody from the group um, makes a Zoom call and one person has their microwave and they, you know, take those measurements and stuff. Like, does it have to be in person or could we do no, that, it over? That could work. Uh, you just are trusting that one person to be able to make that measurement really good. And, and it would help that you guys look at him making him or her making that measurement. But no, that, that would be a fine way. Uh, I was mentioning, if you look in the actual assignments, the descriptions, I tell you, there is a, a single microwave available in JC26. Uh, and I gave you the frequency of that one. So everybody can use that one if they want, and then everybody be on the same page. Uh, you just have to find some time that it's not being used, which is most of the time that class is not being used. So you could do that. Uh, I'll also give you a longer deadline just because I wanted to make sure you all had a chance to see me and ask me questions before then. So like, instead of it being a week from today, it's like, uh, actually, I think for you guys, it's going to be, uh, the Monday after a week from today. So you got a long time. Okay, thank you. No uh, somebody else had other questions. I also would like to ask about the lab that was due today. Hey, David, or anybody else, y'all have any questions? Okay, it looks like they're hanging out here for a little while. So, what's your question about the lab that's due today? So, the equations um, that you were showing us to do, like the sigma. Um, I think it's in like, I'm looking for it right now. Mm -hmm. um, the sigma equal, the sigma sub f equals the square root of partial of f with respect to x times sigma x squared plus all that yes. one. Yes, sir, those sort of things. So when you told us to do um, working out those problems, so when it was something like, I believe it said maybe 3x, plus 2y, um, are we just plugging that into the formula or mm -hmm. going through a derivation? Yeah, so the formula is the sigma x here. Let me go ahead and share the screen so you can see what I'm talking about here. So I'm going to share my, uh, share my iPad screen again. Okay, the formula that you're using is this one. And actually, I asked you for not only sigma f, I also asked you for sigma f over f. That's the two things you have to do in that. So the formula for sigma f is the partial of f with respect to x, sigma x, whole quantity squared, plus partial of f with respect to y, sigma y. That's supposed to be a y there times the whole quantity squared. That's the only variables in this one. So, whoa, darn it, my iPad keeps turning everything into an eraser. Okay, so that's the formula. So what we do is we take the partial of F, let's say F just to not give you exactly the answer, let's say F of X, Y is equal to seven X plus eight Y. Okay, so the partial of f with respect to x is just going to be 7, and the partial of f with respect to y is just going to be 8. So I'm going to say sigma f is equal to the square root of 7 squared sigma x squared plus 8 squared sigma y squared. That's actually it. I mean, that's the whole formula. Now, if you um, want to know what sigma f over f is, this one's a little uglier because it, these are added together. If, it, if the terms weren't added together, if they're multiplied and divided, it'd make a lot prettier thing, but we're going to do it. And you can't necessarily always simplify them. So sigma F over F is just going to be that same thing. It's sigma F divided by F bar. In other words, your best estimate F. So that's going to be the square root of seven squared. Notice I didn't even take time to multiply seven times seven. Uh, that, that's how little I care about your simplification of it. This is going to be divided by uh, 7x plus 8y. And technically, since it's f bar, this is really the x bar and the y bar that you're dividing by. Now, if I put that inside, that's what we do to try to simplify it. This would be 49 sigma x squared plus 64 sigma y squared 
And in fact, I'm gonna make this a bigger square root. And what's gonna happen is I wanna square that binomial. That's gonna be 49 X squared plus uh, 56 X, and there's a bar over and an X bar, Y bar plus 64 uh, y squared, that's that's it. That's sigma f over f. You can see there's nothing <laughs> there's nothing that's going to factor out of any of that crap, right? So that's that's pretty much it. Now, if it had been something pretty like x times y, this problem would have gave, given us, by dividing it out, you would have gotten a really nice formula. In this case, you get nothing. So that's literally the whole thing you would do in that case. Okay, that makes sense. Um, thank you. And then... By the I way, think... we're using in that lab you're talking about, this is one of the things, we're gonna measure X and that's gonna be given as X plus or minus some Sigma X, right? And it turns out that Lambda is actually equal to two times X. And of course, that means since lambda, since lambda is a function of x, you can say lambda is equal to lambda of x is equal to 2x. Then you'd say, okay, well, this is a single function of one variable. So sigma lambda is in fact the derivative of lambda with respect to x times sigma x. And of course, the derivative of lambda, despite how horribly I wrote that. the derivative of lambda with respect to x is just two. So we end up getting two times sigma x. So that's some of the stuff you gotta do when you're doing uh, that lab is you gotta make sure you're actually uh, following your error and all that stuff. You're then gonna have to convert that uh, to, to meters instead of centimeters. So that's a whole nother problem but you can see basically where it is. Okay. Do you have another question on that? It's you and I only, actually no, David's here. David, did you have a question, bud? Trying to make sure uh, we give everybody a turn. I think you're just sitting around to hear. Okay, Michaela, you got another one? Um, yes, I was mainly asking about that to confirm that, um, like, you had given us different measurements to uh, to calculate with for the rectangular prism or rectangular solid, that is. Um, right. So I was trying to make sure that wasn't something we were plugging in for X and Y to do with these um, different problems. Oh no, those that those problems at the end where I asked you to, to find out what they were, those were just supposed to be for arbitrary X and arbitrary Y. So it's, it's you deriving general formulas like these red boxes that I got. Okay, thank you. No problem. Anything else? You need any more details on that uh, lab? Um, you had told us the two tables that are in there. One of them was just as an example. Mm -hmm. Okay, was that because um, the first table is where it breaks down how to use it, and then the second one is in the section that says now that you have. Now that you've had a brief refresher and some examples, it is your turn to do some calculations. Yeah, um, so you just fill out one of those tables. The second one was the one mm -hmm. I meant you to fill out. And you can even fill that out with a, a pen, uh, or if you're using an iPad, you can just write it in by hand with your pencil, or you can type it in. Uh, just make sure if you type it, just make sure you make it a color font other than black so I can tell what you typed in versus what was already there. Okay, so for the calculations that it's talking about, where it's one through six, it says show that for f of 
x comma y equals x plus y sigma f equals all that um is that where we're going back to the equations that you gave us or wait no you said that's arbitrary so yeah those those ones where i ask you to calculate what it is for mv cosine theta for instance or what it is for x 2x plus 3y or something those those are just pretend like x is a value uh x bar would be its best estimate and sigma x would be its error but you don't know any more than that you don't know what those numbers are or anything okay so it's all symbolic right okay got it thank you so much no problem all right have a great evening you too All right, I'll call it a day. Have a good one, everybody. Let's stop sharing this. David, do you not have any questions, sir? I reckon not. Might not even be here.